nevertheless, I think uh, I have to do my my, my bit of uh, uh, in terms of promoting MIS. So just give me one minute if you may on MIS. So if you may, um, MIS is actually a non-profit organization, uh, and we are into our forty second year this year. Um, one of our founding members is uh, Prof. Tan Chin Kyung. Uh, hi, Prof. Hi, guys. Okay, um, so it's a very instrument uh, person, instrumental in terms of the formation of MIS. So, what we have said that we are a non profit organization, our pure existence is to create and to connect marketers. Okay, so, that is our mission. And today, uh, we are the only national body in Singapore itself that provide the platform in terms of creating and connecting the marketers within Singapore. And of course, by, uh, in order for us to do so, we have initiative in terms of executive development trainings. Uh, and that is actually one of the ways for us to serve the community by offering some of the latest insight in terms of marketing. And that's where Prof. Chef uh, will be sharing with us on some of his initi initiative in launching some of his program and uh, through MIS. Okay, and so um, I, shall, I will not take up a lot of time from him, but I would like to appeal to uh, the audience here today. Please look at MIS and to do join us. Um, most of our, our council members here, in fact, all our council members here are volunteers. We have one way or another benefited from MIS and we came back to serve as volunteers and we are honorary positions. And therefore, uh, uh, well, I've, I've, uh, I've actually gotten some of your name cards and I see that there are a lot of very high level profile people, you know. And next year, uh, just to share with you, one of our direction, directions is actually to, to cater to the C-suite people, which will be having a lot of networking involvement uh, involving the C-suite uh, uh, management. So hopefully, uh, if you can actually, at the end of the sessions, do pick up the application form. I have uh, with me Dennis. Dennis, please step forward. Uh, Dennis is actually our manager looking at our membership, taking care of our memberships uh, for both the corporate and individual members. Okay, and most of all, I think uh, today is also for me to thank the Indian Institute of Management uh, for co-organizing co these events. And thanks to the London, uh, alumni of uh, Indian uh, Institute of Management for your appearance. And we certainly hope to see you more often with us uh, moving forward in our marketing guru sessions. So, um, I'm not going really to take up much time from you, Prof. So, uh, let me hand over the mic to Prof. Please help me to give a round of applause. Thank you. Our leadership, public speaking, higher education, research, and teaching. Uh, in 1975, the year that I was born, he was ranked amongst the top seven professors of marketing. And uh, recently I had a chance to look at a keynote address that we had done on digital marketing and the clarity with which he was looking at trends on today's digital world and the predictions he had for the future had me spread out. So I think it's something that is worth listening to. Today, amongst other things, he's going to be talking about uh, his views on India's role in the Asia theatre and discuss why it is in India's economic, political, and security interest aligned with Asia. Together, we hope to examine whether Japan, South Korea, and China will emerge as the largest investors in India, why Indian multinationals will shift their global business strategy to enter and invest in Asia, what role ASEAN will play in the emerging alignment of China and India, and how Singapore can take advantage of its strategic location in this new era. So it's an honor, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Chen. Thank you. Institute. Originally we wanted to call China India America Institute, but when you make logos and the other stuff, it sounds like CIA Institute, which is one of the brands you don't want to associate with, right? Very much so. Unless you want to be underground. So and I didn't want America in the front, so instead it became India China America Institute. First point, I will make several points and open up. The first point is that, like Vienna during the Cold War became the most strategic city 
for dialogue on two sides behind the scenes. In this new shift, Singapore becomes the most strategic location in a city. And behind the scenes already, in fact, uh, military to military dialogue is taking place here between uh, India and China, which is interesting to watch, uh, between US and India to some extent, which is interesting. So this is becoming the hubbing mechanism and it's going to grow in its importance over time. And I do want to give you some personal background. Uh, I came to Singapore first time, even my closest friend does not know, in 68, just as a wandering tourist. And my memory of Singapore is that it looked just like a Fiji island to me. Think about that. Then uh, Professor Tan Chin Kyung, who returned back after his doctorate, we are in the same discipline, invited me in 1981 as an external examiner at NUS. And that one was suddenly, now you see, a brand new city out of nowhere and huge transformation. And since 81, I've been watching about the rise of Singapore as a city and of course the standard of living and everything that goes with it. Singapore will have its own challenges down the road, we'll talk about that one. But it's very fascinating that this current architecture is going to move in this direction. A couple of quick comments. China actually will, in fact, I've been mapping completely the rise of China as almost parallel to the rise of Japan. Everything that Japanese did, China will happen, including aging. China will age much faster than their demographers ever forecasted, and China's growth will slow down in about 10, 15 years Share because it's a very affluent nation already, which means you reach the asymptote, the plateau, you know, pretty much it comes to you. Uh, but more importantly, the aging population, and therefore one of the biggest, biggest market opportunities, which we think of all nations, Japan will take advantage, is the health care aspect. Japan behind the scenes, just like HDTV, just like uh, VHS, remember? <laughs> uses its domestic market with a very collaborative approach to create a global standard using Japan as a market. It's a matter of time before the Japanese will become the largest, largest enterprises in the healthcare sector. And of course, Singapore is investing massively in the healthcare. Back to Mr. Modi. He obviously has a rock star personality. He loves crowds and crowds love him. You saw recently what happened. Uh, but his closest, closest mind and allies are two countries that unless you know him personally, he would not share with you Japan and Germany, surprisingly. And Japan will be the massive investor in India first of all countries. Watch Japanese investment. And as you know, when Japanese go, they go together. It's not like one enterprise, it's almost the whole Zaibastu, the 12 big enterprises, and they're still very large, no matter how you look at it. The Mitsubishi Group, the Mitsui Group, the Sumitomo, and obviously the Toyota Group, etc. Watch that. If the Japanese go someplace, who follows immediately? South Korea. And India is a very large market to be contested because India does not have large native organizations or companies in many businesses. In fact, one of the biggest problems in India is it really has no scale. India is so fragmented in terms of capacity uh, that I've been strongly advocating for India to be globally competitive. Must actually, government must pay money to consolidate the Indian industries. There are just too many banks, for example. Size is big, but it's fragmented by so many banks. There's no need for so many banks. There is no need for so many cement companies. And I have a theory called the rule of three, very powerful, very much used by everybody, especially mergers and acquisition people like you know, Goldman Sachs type. And we clearly see that India, through government encouragement, RBI can pretty much tell the banks to merge. It's very possible. And that's true across many industries. Only places where you see the rule of three happening is probably in the wireless industry. You have the Airtel, the Vodafone, and there's a third player about to emerge that are fragmented by some merger acquisitions, clearly. So India has to scale up through consolidation within the country. 
which is interesting. There are many industries where India just is not there, like consumer electronics, like appliances. The godrej of the world are just too small. I have advised Whirlpool uh, for I don't know how many years, and you saw even uh, General Electric just exit the whole business, appliances, which was a core business at one time, sold to Electrolux, and Electrolux is becoming a very large global player, but Whirlpool and Electrolux both worry about the rise of higher out of China. Higher in unit production only is the largest, but not in value. It's a matter of time before higher has to go to India. So one of the very clear hypotheses we are saying is that Japan will come first, South Korea will follow, LG for example, Samsung. They are not just cell phones, they are very big in appliances. And then there is huge market in India, surprisingly, for appliances, especially refrigerators, you know. And washing machines are coming along, etc. So I'm watching that. Automotive is very fascinating. I worked for 30 years in the automotive industry worldwide. And Toyota will be number one, continue, which uh, I had forecasted eight, nine years ago, and there was a skepticism in Detroit. How can a Japanese company become number one? It has become. Number two will be Volkswagen. Watch Volkswagen. Its presence in China has been long term, paying off very well, not only just Volkswagen volume brand, but the Audi. And Volkswagen will come in India in a big way. So other than Maruti, there is no room for any Indian automobile makers, whether it's Tata or whether it's in fact Mahindra. They all will become either niche players or exit the business. That's a radical change. Of course, because of that, there will be always political stakeholding, right? People will go to the government for protectionism, etc. But if the market opens up, there will be huge rationalization of Indian industry triggered by outsiders rather than insiders, which is a very interesting proposition. And the third country, and probably the one that will make India's future, India's future will be made by non-Indians more so than by Indians. And the third one will be China. There is no question in my mind that the Indian government, despite all of the mistrust of China, for whatever reason, legacy as well as you know, the communist uh, background, whatever it is, uh, India has no choice but to open up for Chinese investment in India. And it's going to happen. This Prime Minister is quite, quite fond of China, which is very fascinating. And therefore, political leadership is in a, such a strong position that they will execute some of these things before uh, it's late. I also believe that this current party, which just got elected, I have met them, they're already planning out how to win the next five-year election. And they will do it. I would say I will bet any money that they will be in power for 10 years which is a long cycle for stability. And once you have a political stability, then investment comes in in a big way. So we think that's going to happen pretty much. So that's one of the key areas. I'll then talk about four or five areas where Singapore can become a gateway. The project that I did is uh, to make this as a distribution country. Country was aspiring to be a manufacturing country. But it does not have raw material to hub here. In those days when I worked, uh, the, um, the market was only two and a half million Singaporeans, now it's about five or six million uh, through immigration and other reasons. And of course, uh, there is cheap labor anymore. So when you give incentives, everybody will come but rip you off. It's not sustainable. So instead, we made this into a distribution country. Four flows where we began. Flow of products, so Singapore seaport. Have you seen the number of ships out there? In the 80s, it would be very few. Today, it's hundreds of ships. You can't believe the amount of shipping. And of course, Rotterdam was the benchmark, and we surpassed Rotterdam long ago. Flow of people, Changi Airport, to capture the north sub traffic with Australia's strategic plan for 2000 was to align with the ASEAN. I mean, none of us knew the rise of China at that time in the late 80s, essentially. And uh, you know, Hong Kong will be surrendered in 1997 was the only thing that we knew. And so north-south traffic from Australia to Beijing, which I think Changi Airport has captured very nicely, and now the east-west traffic with non-stop engines and all the stuff that we can do. So Narita, Narita Airport, as well as Hong Kong, begins to now have a competition from Singapore, and I think it can articulate. And you make money not on passenger revenues. 
You make money on others serving other airlines, which is a very different architecture. A lot more money in being a supplier to the airline. Airlines can go bankrupt, but suppliers are happy, which is a very key thing. Third one has been flow of capital. Now we can have a stock exchange here unless more headquarters global are based here for companies. India is moving some companies here. Also, we think really the third one is going to be private equity, which is Temasa came out of that project. Big success. Fourth one is flow of information, which we have very good uh, national computer board, for example, as well as Singtel, convergence of IT. I think we have done a fantastic job here and making it into a, what I would call a smart nation now, right? It is not a smart city anymore. And of course, you have the smart planet, which is IBM slogan. So this country probably will have a slogan called smart nation, which is a correct slogan. This country is smart. Smart means many things. Not just technology smart. You know, in every way, it's a smart nation. And I think there's a new branding that will happen properly. I think it's very powerful, very positive. I'm very positive for Singapore's future in the process, pretty much. I mean, the only problem will be the talent acquisition, the labor, etc., that you invite, immigration policies. Typically, all advanced countries struggle with that one. And two more flows will come in, uh, which is interesting. R&D flow will happen through Singapore Gateway, we think so. And each one of them has huge value add multi-billion dollar industries. So we take, uh, some, let's say, Singapore seaport. You have the whole logistics and warehousing as a huge market. And once you put logistics and warehouse hubbing here, world has to show up here. It's not just the shipping lines. You know, it goes beyond that one. So we have articulated about the future. Let's talk on India. India's future lies with Asia because Asia is the largest market emerging, largest trading block. I personally have gone on record more than a year ago that ASEAN will not survive as a regional block. Each country will make free trade agreements with India and free trade agreements with China. Game is over, which is very important. So the vision about ASEAN becoming a block Unlike European Union, it did not integrate very well. So, for example, banking sector. There is no way DBS will be allowed in Malaysia because of the regulatory process. And, of course, this is a state enterprise here. And very interesting to watch, right, pretty much. So you see so much of inefficient infrastructure or regulatory barriers even within the region. And there is still mistrust of countries among the regions, which is interesting. So within region, Mistrust is much greater than we have want to acknowledge publicly. Uh, European Union has gone beyond that mentally now, I must tell you. And as you know, European Union is taking charge where ECB, now which is the Central Bank of Europe, calling the shots on the German banking, okay? which was unthinkable at one time. ECB is right now actually taking charge to tell Ireland not to have this double taxes in heaven where companies like Apple are locating there to minimize or avoid the taxes, for example. These are all structural issues. There is no labor mobility. Okay. Still, labor is an issue uh, within the region, not just coming into uh, Singapore, but within the So this is still a region, but it's not likely to sustain in the future. India, here are the four, five major initiatives. The first one and the biggest one, and take it very seriously, what this government has coined as a phrase, which is a very strategic phrase, make in India, not made in India. What does that mean? It means just like China, you can come here and manufacture your product. It is your brand, and it is your market outside of India. Are you with me? And India will become the second sourcing destination and diversify, people who buy from China will diversify. U.S. will be the first one to leave that market. U.S. will definitely would like to de-risk all of its eggs in one basket called Made in China. The country depends so much, it's very likely that we'll say now, we'll find an alternate place, which is India. And surprisingly, India is competitive, which is very fascinating. Despite everything we hear, it doesn't have the scale doesn't have the infrastructure, pretty much. But in these kinds of businesses, you don't need large infrastructure because they're not serving the domestic market. It's more like an SEZ approach, essentially, pretty much. So 
we think that's why smart city project is very strategic in the process. Not only, so that's very key. So make in India means an American company making products in made in India, selling in America with a label made in India, and will sell very well. One of the largest countries like that doing it, make in India and sell it in its own market will be China. Please. Chinese men, starting with Japan, mark my words, in two to three years from now, Japanese products will be made in India to be sold in Japan and Japan's other markets wherever Japan goes. Korea will do the same thing. And we think biggest player eventually will be not American enterprises who look for domestic market, but China will actually like to diversify its dependence on its own nation. It has too much assets locked into production which are unproductive in many ways. So China will clearly outsource industries to other nations because it becomes advanced just like America did, just like Europe has done, just like Singapore is trying to do, or just like Japan has done, which is a very important architecture. Which means the future of India is tied with China whether it likes it or not. Despite the South Sea excursion, right? Despite the tensions that we have between Japan and China, and Japan has more interest in moving to India because it cannot depend on China with the tensions that are going on. Uh, the two really have a conflicting relationship, uh, which is fascinating. So biggest opportunity is making India by foreign manufacturers to access Indian resources. India is very rich in four major resources. It was always rich, but nobody utilized its richness. Agriculture, dairy, it's the largest producer of milk and the largest consumer of milk in the world. And dairy is a very key ingredient. Cattle, it's the largest cattle. And of course, human talent. Which leads to the second major area, which is not the second in priority, but one of the largest talent would be professional services, all will hub in India, or in Singapore as a technical, you know, hub to get access to Indian talent, not for the Singapore market, but the world market. So in IT business, that my colleague Giri Japan, so it's very fascinating. These countries know how to do business with emerging markets. America brings its ideology and its governance which comes in its way. So corporations may have the intent to do it, but they can't do it, right? So in the meanwhile, the window goes out. And I, I personally believe that uh, the new development bank is more strategic than we all have realized. It will clearly, clearly challenge the World Bank. It's a matter of time. It will be one that will be used to invest. Remember, China has huge reserves. Needs to have some place properly deployed. Is south-south investment, which means an emerging economy investing in another emerging economy as opposed to advanced country money going to emerging economy, which has been the traditional paradigm. So infrastructure and its ports, its airports, and its roads. The third area is energy. And I'm trying to do something. You just do value add for me, right? As we do in Bangladesh now. Chinese will simply say it's not acceptable anymore. You are exploiting my national resources, right? I needed that at one time, but no longer. Chinese will definitely become global enterprises. It's a mandate now. They have to move very fast. So China will selectively reduce production for the world. Pretty much in some fashion. And so we think so that their trade will continue. And back to the old days where India can become for the West Asia centrally. I think it's very powerful. Except for the terrorism aspects, if you open up the border in a how do you trust people and all this stuff? Other than that, I clearly see. I mean, it's a very large. I'm very fond of the West Asia because there's a whole moderate Arab nations are fantastic opportunities. In the airline business, we have figured out that all American carriers will become basically domestic. There's no way they can remain globally competitive, period. They're in a denial stage, just like automobile industry was there before that passenger tires. I worked before that on steel. American Airlines are in a denial, all three major carriers. Emirates will become the dominant global player. 
so may be the Etihad on Abu Dhabi and Qatar. They are truly global. Singapore Airlines can't make it uh, that journey either. They have already done that analysis, which is fascinating. Think about that one. And what's the advantage? Dubai offers today that if you fly in and out of Dubai, your fuel cost will be at least 25% cheaper on your flight out. So when Air India was thinking of hubbing in Dubai, not in Bombay, think about it. It completely changes the world architecture about hubbing in the airline business. Alliances are the only way they're holding together. Right now. And Emirates doesn't want to join any alliance, which is very strategic uh, in any time. So I, I, I think West Asia is another opportunity. Any other questions? Singapore has a very strategic location, I think. And it can utilize that uh, pretty much. Uh, with China on the one hand, where the relationships are very deep and strong, and on India, where we are creating deeper relationships. Pretty much. So it can become the gateway where China and India cannot get together officially, for example. It can become a gateway on both sides. Any other questions? Anything else? Um, we don't have to hang around till time, right? It's OK. <laughs> it's okay. Anything on marketing? <laughs> Any thoughts, please? Anybody? Prof, uh, well, you say that Singapore has a position to play both in China and in India right now. But if you were to look at the population of China, the composition of, sorry, the composition of Singapore, uh, well, the majority are Chinese and therefore the alliance towards China. What about towards the India? Yeah, I think it's a, Chin uh, Chong knows, uh, you know, the analog of Singapore as a small bird flying on the two wings of China and India. The wings have to be equal. And we have seen the change in the government policy in the country. Uh, look at the Prime Minister's office. Two Deputy Prime Ministers, relatively equal. So I think you have to equalize that immigration that has come in, especially professional class, is massively Indian-centric. If we analyze the data, uh, Chinese are coming, but more as service workers, primarily. It's very interesting, partly because of the language and other issues. So in many ways, uh, I think it has to equalize properly. So, so I do believe that uh, it's going to happen. It's a matter of time, pretty much. Uh, it is a great location advantage, as I mentioned. And this, I have articulated seven flows total. And as a gateway for those flows, it can make you know, And the government has to restructure. Maybe right now, we are organized by boards, right? We have a EDB as a board, for example, we have a tourism as a board. What it, we did, a, you know, I think, National Marketing Council, of, each one has their own chief marketing officer doing their own stuff. But I think each now has to have a national councillor on each floor. Flow of products, all agencies, there's a coordinating effort. Flow of money, all agencies. And it does not have to be the monitor of the of Singapore, by the way. That's the whole point. It is overarching coordinating body which gets all these people harmonized to think the same way, which is very good. One of the major opportunities, surprisingly, is private equity here, which is a very large hubbing place. And you see Blackstone using this to go to India. Blackstone announced publicly, right, next year when they host it, they will have $6 billion investment committed in India already. At this last meeting in, uh, I think it was in uh, Washington rather than New York, right? Uh, Luxton committed publicly, which means you don't do that thing till everything is in place, obviously. I mean, very interesting so, so I think the world will invest in India through Singapore Gateway and other gateways. So it's very fast, fascinating. I am very fond of creating a stock market, which is a convertible debt is a big instrument. Nobody has tapped into a stock market commodity. We have the stocks, we have the bond market, but what about convertible debt market? One can create a stock exchange. The size is very large. And only countries like Singapore can do it quickly. Because you know, it's a pretty small nation. Everybody knows everybody, etc. And so it can be it can, can be organized, which is fascinating scenario. So. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of marketing in China and India. And yes. We, it's relatively familiar because we over here operating all of those markets. Uh, what are your observations on the trends of marketing in, in Africa? How does they, I know it's not, it's a continent, it's not a country, so we can't okay. quite say, but what do you observe as a marketing trend in Africa? 
the first thing likely to be, my Africa has about 900 million population, all wanting to become middle class. So this unbranded, the biggest market in India and Africa is unbranded products made into branded products. Unorganized sector making organized, biggest opportunity. Anything you touch is a gold mine. Africa is the same way. The young people are all becoming very modern cousins of the Western world. All of them don't know how to cook, clean, or take care of their own children anymore. Biggest outsourcing is at home, not IT outsourcing. It's a very large market. So Africa begins to become a market that way, but Africa will be a sourcing des destination first. For sourcing and destination like China, you build infrastructure first. Now, which was the sourcing destination for England when it was almighty? America. Americans, uh, in, uh, British built the railroads, the waterways, you know, the great water highways, etc., in order to access cotton or cotton made products, for example. They outsourced two industries. Ricardo were more, was more influential on the British economy than Adam Smith. And Ricardo was a trade guy, like Jagdish Bhagwati, right? I think, and he's a follower of that. And Ricardo basically convinced to outsource two key industries. One was steel, one was textiles, where? India and America. Cotton was grown in India. We had the iron ores. That's why India has steel industry, starting from Tata Daisy, right? Very interesting to so. so that's what Africa will have to as a sourcing destination by other emerging economies like China. It's not Western countries. Europe has been very silent on Africa for 200 years. And, that's and I think the game is over, mind you. You have to really know how much Chinese are wired into Africa. Countries like Angola, is the numbers are tiny. Most Africans are now encouraged to learn Mandarin as a second language. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> not the French, which is some of them, not the Dutch, which was to be the case, or the English, for example. Same in Latin America. So it's a very different world out there. Just like rise of America at one time. But you know, given the legacy of communism, but I'm a very strong believer that the best capitalists of today are ex-communist countries, period. And many of you, I've very strongly advocated in the policy area, best thing is to do, no change the party at all. Because when you change a party through revolutionary mechanisms like Poland or Russia, it's very disruptive and the country cannot get back on track for decades. Sometimes derails completely. What you do is keep the party the same but change its manifesto, what it stands for. Rather than the communist manifesto, that's what China did. It's one of the few nations that has transitioned very well from communist to capitalism. In India, this government will transition from socialistic investment approach to somewhat not. He's very pragmatic, first of all. I don't think he can be labeled as uh, this ideology. He's just very pragmatic. Uh, and pragmatism will prevail in India. It will uh, rise above all that and make sure that all the political differences, you know, ideological, are subsided. So I'm very optimistic about India with this new leader and hopefully he will survive. That's it. Very nice to see you guys. I hope this was helpful, enjoyable, interesting, but very geopolitical, right? <laughs> uh, rather than marketing. So maybe next time we'll get to just on MIS, right? So we should have a session just on marketing. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>